Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Canada's Indigenous Services Minister explains how Ottawa is trying to help those cope with the tragedy of the residential schools. The Alberta government released details of the rollout of its second dose of COVID-19 vaccines. And following the tragic shooting in San Jose, California, which claimed many lives, we hear how the Christian community is helping out. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller says it's shameful that the Catholic Church has not apologized for its role in Canada's residential school system. A papal apology was one of 94 recommendations made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Following a meeting between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Pope Francis in 2018, the Church later declined to issue one. The federal government is allocating $27 million to uncover unmarked graves at former residential schools across the country following the discovery of 215 children's bodies in Kamloops, B.C. last week. Miller says awareness and help are key right now. We don't have a full sense of the impact of it. Um, our, our, our best sense comes through what we're seeing across the land through your reports and, 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 and on social media. Um, we've reached out. Uh, to communities to get a sense for for what what that is our immediate focus has been um, the dozens of communities that had kids sent to the Kamloops residential school school that that is the most acute need at this time um, I think getting out the awareness that there is um, the hope for wellness line um, and the, um, the residential school survivor line is important for people but there is a need that is goes well uh, beyond that the residential school in Kamloops, B.C. was operated by the Roman Catholic Church between 1890 and 1969 before the government took it over and ran it as a day school until 1978. The leader of Treaty 6 First Nations in Alberta says they're upset by Premier Jason Kenney's comments on so-called cancel culture in Canada. Grand Chief Vernon Watchmaker says Kenney's comments are insensitive toward First Nations history. Kenny said if the movement continues, most of the country's founding fathers could one day be removed from the history books. He was responding to a question about a Calgary school changing its name to remove a reference to Hector Louis Langevin. Langevin is considered one of the fathers of Confederation, but also played a major role in creating Canada's residential schools. Reports say at least 821 children died while attending such schools, but experts say the final number is likely much higher. Premier Kenny says cancel culture is real, and as a society, we have to be careful that it does not become the new standard. I think almost the entire founding leadership of our country gets cancelled. Tommy Douglas, who recommended the use of eugenics uh, to um, uh, sterilize the weak, as he said, uh, to uh, if we talk about mem members of the, fa fa the famous five, uh, heroes of Canadian feminism and the fight for equality for women, uh, some of them were advocates of uh, eugenics that we would now regard uh, as deplorable. So uh, if we go full force into cancel culture, then we're cancelling uh, uh, most, if not all, of our history. Instead, I think we should learn from our history. We should learn uh, from our achievements, but also our failures. A few Alberta mayors have decided not to seek re-election this fall, including the mayors of Calgary, Edmonton, and Lethbridge Mayor Chris Spearman. Now, the mayor of Crossnes Pass, however, is going to be seeking out another term. Mayor Blair Painter joins me. So, Mayor, why did you decide to run again? I decided to seek re-election mainly because I really enjoy the position and the opportunity to uh, move our community forward. And um, I'm very proud of, so far, the list of accomplishments that we've been able to achieve. And uh, I still have a long list to go. Now, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding coal projects in your region. Many who are against the coal mining on the eastern slopes of the Rockies say it really threatens our water supply and wildlife, but you have a bit of a different take on it. Well, it's a very hot subject, uh, to say the least. Um, definitely uh, people are for it, and there are people that are against it. Uh, not everyone in our community is, uh, is, is for coal mining. Uh, a lot feel that we should uh, leave that in our past. Um, but the, the majority uh, that I can tell of the residents in our community are definitely uh, hoping that this moves forward. It's a great opportunity for uh, 
uh, our, our economy, our local economy, um, the opportunity to um, gain employment within our community rather than having to travel out of our community. And of course, the opportunity to bring uh, more people in to the Crow's Nest Pass to live. Thanks so much, Mayor. That was Crow's Nest Pass Mayor Blair Painter, who says he will be seeking another term later this fall. A ransomware attack in the world's largest meat processing company disrupted production just weeks after a similar incident shut down a U.S. oil pipeline. But Brazil's JBS said it made progress in dealing with a cyber attack and expects the vast majority of its plants to be operating later today. JBS says its large processing facility in Brooks was back up and running Tuesday afternoon after being idled since Sunday. JBS is the second largest producer of beef, pork and chicken in the United States. A new food preparation and delivery service is taking off in Medicine Hat. Chris Walney started Street Chef in April of this year and as the response has been overwhelming so far. He works in northern Alberta as a kitchen service manager, but due to high demand, he's about to run his business full time. Walney gives us a little sample of what he has to offer. Uh, home, nice homely meals and really good portions. And then we deliver them out to the customers. We don't want to use the Uber Eats and all that kind of stuff. We want to stay local and keep it cheap for the customers as well. We've had a lot of people asking for the pork stuffed tenderloin wrapped in bacon. It's a really good dish. It's got a um, nice flavor too, stuffed with cream cheese, spinach. So it's a really nice dish. And same as the uh, coconut curry chicken. It's absolutely beautiful. It's so popular that I put it on with the shrimp. And that's all I get is when we get in the curry again, when we get in the curry again. Walney adds that he has keto and vegetarian options available as well. Well, it was quite the scorcher out today, which means there will be many vulnerable people in our community that will need access to water this summer. The Interfaith Food Bank and Lethbridge Food Bank are encouraging the community to participate in their water drive. Executive Director of the Interfaith Food Bank Society of Lethbridge explains how the donations will be distributed to quench the thirst of the most vulnerable. This is all through partnerships and collaboration uh, where we have the food banks accepting the larger donations and then working with distribution partners to get it out into the hands of the people who need it most. So we're partnering with our Sage clan locally as well as Streets Alive and My City Care. Some of them will actually be doing walking patrols where they're handing out water and others will have it at events or at their sites where the homeless population can reach them. Lethbridge College announced it has a rescheduled date for its movie on the coolies. The event was postponed last fall due to the legendary Lethbridge wind. Now the new date for the drive-in theater will be Saturday, June 26th with two showings at 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. featuring the 1985 classic movie Goonies. The drive-in theater will be set up in parking lot F on the east side of the campus and will feature a new wind-resistant LED screen. More information on the movie of the Coolies can be found on the college's website. Yesterday's adoption of the 2022 to 2031 Capital Improvement Program included close to $5 million allocated for the purchase of land and functional study into relocating Fire Station No. 3, which is currently located at 16th Avenue South. Greg Adair, who is the Deputy Chief of Strategic Services, says the need has grown beyond what the fire hall can accommodate. We have more equipment and more needs that we respond to with more apparatus than we can physically fit in that location at this time. Fire station number three was built in 1964. So it's a very old fire station. We've been able to uh, utilize it and um, get a lot of life out of that. In addition to that, we know that there's a better location for fire station number three, which will provide a better response to our community. Lethbridge is home to one of Canada's only multi-purpose integrated health facilities. That means anything from a teeth cleaning to massage therapy can be booked at 608 Health's brand new location in downtown Lethbridge. As Ainsley O'Reilly explains now, the facility is all part of a greater plan to revitalize the city's downtown core. A grand opening and ribbon cutting ceremony was planned for the former East Meets West Health Centre to celebrate its new downtown location, 608 Health. COVID-19 restrictions have put those celebrations on pause, but in just a few weeks, the community has welcomed the brand new multi-dimensional health building. Each individual patient requires individual type care and an individual treatment plan. By July 15th, all of the doctors and specialists will be working at 608, giving Lethbridge residents the opportunity to explore numerous elements of health and wellness. We're kind of that one-stop shop and um, 
you know, whether it's your teeth, like you mentioned, or you need a massage, stiff neck, acupuncture. The first of its kind in Canada, the facility is also the first in the city to take advantage of incentives provided through the Heart of Our Cities TRIP program. The objective is to fill vacancies and aims to revitalize the downtown. There's going to be those people who are coming down for their services, um, utilizing their parking space and hopefully walking throughout all of the other businesses within the downtown core. The heart of our city recently launched this year's Reimagine Downtown Activation Grant and businesses can apply at lethbridge.ca forward slash downtown incentives. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. The Alberta government is rolling out its second dose of COVID-19 vaccines. The province is allowing anyone 12 and older who's had a first shot to book a booster before the end of the month. Under the plan, anyone who received their first dose in March can now book a second shot right away. Anyone vaccinated in April can start booking June 14th and those vaccinated in May can begin booking on June the 28th. The province says it will allow those who receive the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for their first dose to get either the Pfizer or Moderna shot for their second. The Alberta government has offered critical care to Manitoba as the third wave is peaking in that province. Alberta Health Services says up to 10 patients requiring intensive care will come to Alberta and be cared for at hospitals in both Calgary and Edmonton. Officials say our province has sufficient ICU capacity to ensure that all Albertans needing care will be cared for. AHS teams are working with their counterparts in Manitoba to determine when patient transfers will occur. Manitoba is expecting the third wave to peak sometime next week. Residents in Saskatchewan could be unmasked by July the 11th. The provincial government has set vaccination targets required to prompt the removal of COVID-19 public health measures, such as mandatory masking and limits on gathering sizes. Premier Scott Moe says masking and size gathering limits will be removed three weeks after 70% of everyone in the province aged 12 and older has received their first COVID-19 vaccine dose. That's providing at least three weeks have passed since the beginning of step two of the government's reopening plan. Today, we are at 62% of those 12 and over. The U.S., in comparison, is at 60%. We've, see, we've all seen the large crowns, the crowds south of the border at hockey games, at golf tournaments. We see, I believe, Las Vegas is removing their restrictions today. And over the course of this past weekend, we saw large crowds also at the Indy 500. The U.S. has moved forward with their reopening plan much faster than we have here in Saskatchewan and with lower vaccination rates and their case numbers do continue to fall. Here we are taking a more cautious approach with a higher level of vaccinations required. There are just over a million people in Saskatchewan who are eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, it's 1,033,000 to be exact. So that is, means just over 720,000 people would need to be vaccinated for us to reach that final target. Federal Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says his party opposes conversion therapy because of certain harms it causes for those who are subjected to it. He says the debate right now in Parliament on the law to ban conversion therapy is about whether the bill will address that harm in a way that helps those affected or not and the guarantee that the law does not ban conversations about the issue. Our party opposes conversion therapy and the harm that 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 process and compelling someone to to try and change who they are it 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 can tear at their soul and our party opposes that the 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 debates in parliament are meant to be debates where we can say is the bill itself is the legislation going to address that harm that we all recognize uh, in a way that that helps people affected, helps the victims and prevents new victims from being created and doesn't, uh, doesn't expand into areas where, where it's limiting conversations, these sorts of things. Um, as leader of the party, I'm pro-LGBTQ rights, I'm pro-choice, and I always make sure that we have a, an informed and respectful approach to our debate in the House. It's the standard I hold myself to. It's the standard I hold my MPs to. Tory leader Aaron O'Toole also wants the Trudeau Liberals to launch an investigation into Canada's ties with the Chinese Communist government. Political reporter Brian Lilly says a particular concern is how a lab in Winnipeg came to have a close working relationship with China. We had people with ties to the People's Liberation Army Academy of Medical uh, Sciences working in the lab that you need secret clearance for. Secret clearance that we don't give to many of our own researchers. 
that many in our military would not have access to this type of lab. And we gave that access to a researcher from the People's Liberation Army of China medical team. That, you know, we should know more about that. We should know more about the people that were fired and why they were fired, and the government won't say anything. So far, all they've been doing is turning around and saying, well, you're racist if you ask about this. Mr. Lilly will also discuss how Ottawa is looking at dropping the COVID-19 hotel quarantines. That's coming up after business news. Authorities released police body cam footage of officers entering a San Jose rail yard last week, hearing gunshots and finding a suspect who took his own life after killing nine co-workers. Right, let's just go. Let's go. Let's go. What we'll be showing today is the first contact team. And a contact team is one of the first teams that goes into where there's an active shooter. Yeah, I got um, that white hat. This was, put into, this was put into action, and you'll see in the video, it was put into action by the sheriff's office and San Jose police officers who hardly spoke a word to each other. They knew what their job was, they did their job, and um, actually then confronted the uh, suspect that, that took his own life. Hey, we need that uh, key card over here, bro. All right, I'll push it back to you guys, okay? Yeah. Which one do you need? Door right by us. Oh, s***. We can stay with this one. Third floor. Third floor. Conference room? Okay, I got somebody down in front of me. Wow, some incredible footage. Crisis trained chaplains from the Billy Graham Rapid Response Team are offering help to the heartbroken in San Jose, California, following that shooting on May 26th, which left nine people dead. In this next story, we discover how chaplains are sharing the love of Christ to a devastated city. We are here in San Jose, California, at the City Hall Memorial site, where there was an unfortunate uh, incident last week where nine people were murdered here at the Valley Transit Authority here in San Jose, California. The response has been absolutely amazing. People have received us. They have allowed us to come in and come alongside them. People are hurting. People are confused. People are angry. But that's where we can come in with the love of Christ and surround them and help them just get through as we can. Today we have led... Uh, a couple of people to Christ at the memorial service that they had today there. And um, we would deeply appreciate your prayers and we thank you for your support. Great to see the work that the Billy Graham Rapid Response Team is doing. We had a heat warning for much of southwestern Alberta today and the scorching hot temperature will remain for the next few days. A complete look at the weather picture is coming up. So what is that expression, if you don't like the heat, you get out of the kitchen? Well, Lethbridge was cooking today. Environment Canada issued a heat warning for our region. Jeanette Roche is here now with a complete look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, those hot temperatures should be remaining for the next few days? Yeah, at least until Friday before it cools off significantly for that weekend. But we are in this heat warning, as you did mention, Hell, And with that will become some breaking record temperatures. Uh, even today, as we look at our high today, it was 32 degrees. Well, the record high on this day was actually in 1970. It was 31.7 degrees. So breaking a record today. Haven't hit that since 1970, meaning it hasn't been this hot in 51 years. Looking at tomorrow, we've got a high of 35 degrees. Well, the record for tomorrow was also hit back in 1970. It was 33.3, so we're going to break a record tomorrow. Um, Friday, not quite there with the records, but 29 degrees, still hot before cooling down quite a bit on Saturday. 20 degrees is the high. Uh, on Sunday, cooling down even more so, 18 degrees, and then a chance of showers on Monday with a high of 16, and then back to 18 on Tuesday. So we are just in this high pressure ridge that's bringing with it this intense heat. Uh, so stay hydrated, stay safe, stay in the air conditioning, stay uh, in the shade. Whatever you got to do to stay cool, just do it. Our high temperature um, was at 21 degrees, the, or sorry, the average, I should say that again, average high for this time of year, 21. Average low, 7 degrees, not 21, it's 32, like 
I said before, back in 1970, 51 years ago. Zero was our uh, lowest temperature on record in 1984. 528 is when the sun rose this morning and 931 is when the sun will be setting this evening. So just over 16 hours of daylight. Looking to the west coast now over in Victoria, looking at some strong winds in the Juan de Fuca Strait, 50 kilometer per hour. Uh, mainly cloudy skies though, 22 degrees the high, 21 in Vancouver. Hot across Alberta as we're in that heat warning. Uh, 31 degrees the high in Edmonton, 32 in Calgary. Lots of sunshine looking at possibly breaking some records in those cities as well. Now there is also that high ridge of pressure moving across Saskatchewan, bringing with it intense heat and humidity as well. 36 the high in Saskatoon, going to break a record there tomorrow. Same thing with Regina. Look at that high, 34, 32 degrees in Winnipeg. Winnipeg, the humidity so high that they could develop a risk of a thunderstorm tomorrow afternoon. 21 in Toronto tomorrow, 18 in Ottawa, 21 in Montreal. We're seeing much cooler temperatures, rain and possibilities of thunderstorms in both Toronto and Ottawa tomorrow as well. As we look further east into Fredericton, 24 the high, 25 the high in Halifax with lots of sunshine, about 20k winds in these cities. A little bit cooler on the coast too. Keep that in mind. 24 in Charlottetown, lots of sunshine, cooler on the coast as well. We're looking at 20 degrees and some 20 to 40 kilometer per hour winds in St. John's, Newfoundland. There you go, lots of sunshine there as well. So that is your weather forecast. Today's weather is brought to you by Jeff Reimer of Royal LePage South Country Real Estates, 403-380-1779. Indigo Books and Music trimmed its net loss in the fourth quarter as more than doubling of online sales offset the impact of extensive store closures due to the lockdowns. The Toronto-based company says it lost $39.5 million a year earlier when it took large impairment and deferred tax charges. For the full year, Indigo lost $57.9 million compared to losing $185 million in 2020. Amazon says it will no longer test job seekers for marijuana use. The e-commerce giant, which is the second largest private employer in the United States behind Walmart, is making the change as several states begin legalizing cannabis. In March, a man in New York sued Amazon, saying the company rescinded his job offer at a warehouse when he tested positive for marijuana. That came even though the city banned employers from testing job applicants for marijuana last year. Amazon said it will continue to test workers for other drugs and conduct impairment checks on the job. A Saskatoon-based company says it plans to build a $350 million plant in Regina to process wheat straw before converting it into pulp for paper products. Redleaf Pulp says it will be the first such facility of its kind in Canada. It says construction is set to begin next year. The company says 110 permanent full-time jobs are expected once the plant is fully operational. Around 182,000 tons of pulp from waste wheat straw is expected to be produced each year at the plant. Now... Here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down four points on the day to finish at 19,971. The Dow was up 25 points to 34,600. The S&P 500 was up six points to 4,208. And the NASDAQ was up 19 points to 13,756. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up $1.11 to 68.83 US per barrel. Natural gas was down three cents to 308 US. Gold was down 8 cents to 1908.30 US an ounce, and silver was even at 28.17 US an ounce. Wheat is at $345 per metric ton, barley's at $350, canola's at $899, and corn is at $412 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 358 to 117.13, feeder cattle were up 318 to 152.33, and lean hogs were down 38 cents to 118.25. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 8308 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, the Alberta government is rolling out its second dose of COVID-19 vaccines. The province is allowing anyone 12 and older who had a first shot to book a booster before the end of the month. Under the plan, anyone who received their first dose in March can book a second shot right away. Anyone vaccinated in April can start begin booking June 14th, and those vaccinated in May can begin booking on June the 28th. Coming up, a chat with Toronto Sun columnist and political reporter Brian Lilly, who explains why Ottawa is set to drop the COVID-19 hotel quarantines. That Q&A is on deck. 
A new poll says the mood across Alberta and much of Canada is changing as the weather gets warmer, COVID-19 cases drop, and more people are being vaccinated. To discuss this in more detail is Toronto Sun columnist and one of our regular contributors, Mr. Brian Lilly. Now, Brian, here in Alberta, we've launched into stage one of a reopening plan, which includes patios, back out on the deck again, enjoying a nice cold one, a nice sandwich. Uh, we can also get our hair cut <laughs> once again, but by appointment only. And stage two here in Alberta should take place in a couple of weeks. But it's a little different scenario where you are in Ontario. And most lockdown place in uh, North America, we haven't been able to get legal haircuts since the fall. I'm thinking late October, early November. So it's all it's the a black long market? time, how? It's the black market haircuts uh, it, right now? It's a lot of black market, or, you know, doing the home job with the clippers, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's not been easy. Uh, can't get haircuts, can't go to restaurants. There's takeout. We now have something that uh, my boss coined the term for it, walktails. Uh, people are, uh, bars and restaurants are serving cocktails and beer to go, and people are grabbing them and walking down the street with them, heading off to the park and having a drink with friends or having a meal with friends because, you know, we're social creatures. We need to socialize. Things are still pretty tight here, and I'm not sure that it's going to go as quickly as you guys are. Saskatchewan is moving uh, further ahead. Of course, most of the places we're talking about, BC, Alberta, Sask, we're not as locked down as Ontario is. You know, Manitoba, I understand they're going through a, a big surge again. We're not. Our numbers are, are coming down, but still going very slow. You know, I was watching the, the Leafs-Habs game the other night, in Game 7, when the Leafs, <coughs> they just had a big choking incident with 500 healthcare workers watching on. Those healthcare workers had to be double vaccinated in order to get in, and they were chosen by their local hospitals. Now, compare that to Montreal. You just buy a ticket if you could afford it, and they had 2,500 people in the stands. As there's just 500 healthcare workers watching in Toronto, they're showing people sitting in bars, jumping up and down, hugging, screaming as the Habs are winning. It's very different depending on where you live in Canada right now. Do you think it was really important for Doug Ford to have the health care workers at the game in case the Leafs were choking? I mean, it's good to have, you know, health care professionals. <laughs> that, 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 that has been the joke. I, I will say this uh, for, uh, for the Premier. Um, you know, he wanted fans in the stands one way or another. The only way that public health officials would give the green light for it, and they've got incredible powers here in Ontario, different than other parts of the country, the only way they would allow it was double vaccinated, no more than 550. I mean... The Leafs tried to put out beer and pizza for them, and the public health officials tried to shut down the beer and said, no, 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 you're only allowed water. Someone higher up wisely stepped in and said, no, let them have a beer. Brian, the World Health Organization has given new names to the variants of COVID-19 to stop places from being stigmatized like the India variant. Now, what are we supposed to call them? Uh, alpha, beta, delta, epsilon. If it sounds like you're joining a frat, that's because you are. You know, I thought of Animal House when I first uh, heard about this. Are we all going to join delta, epsilon and spend seven years in college without getting a degree? Um, the, I, I can't believe that they've done this because, you know, when all this started, we were told, well, you can't call it uh, the Wuhan coronavirus. You can't call, you know, say anything related to China or Wuhan in the name of this virus. That's not how we do it, I heard many people say on the media. Really? Uh, tell that to the West Nile virus. Tell that to Lyme disease, named after Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, tell that to Zika virus. Tell that to so many of the diseases that we have. They're named after where they were first noticed, discovered, what have you. So we weren't allowed to call it Wuhan. We weren't allowed to call it China. Then we had a variant from the United Kingdom. Suddenly, it was fine to call it the UK variant or the Kent variant, and nobody batted an eye. There were no memos in newsrooms. There were no, you know, you're being racist claims by politicians until the Indian variant showed up. And then they said, well, you can't call it that. So, look, if we're going to call it, I, I believe the Indian variant is being called Epsilon. That's easier to re remember than B.1.617. And then you have to add on dot one dot two dot two a depending on which sub variant it is. I'll take that, but it is a little ridiculous that this is what our health officials are concerned about, as opposed to actual sick people. The federal government looks like they're set to drop the COVID-19 hotel quarantine. Now, this comes as an expert panel on testing and screening made the recommendation. But Brian, you say the same report shows other problems that Trudeau Liberals will not fix. 
Yeah, so look, they, they looked at the hotel quarantine and they said, it doesn't make sense that you've got one rule for the land border. You drive across, let's say, you walk across, you take a cab across. We've all heard these stories. It doesn't make sense that if you come across the land border, you can just quarantine at home. But if you fly in, you've got to spend up to three days at a hotel. And I say up to because as soon as you get a negative PCR test, you're allowed to go. That could be 12 hours later. Uh, but you're still charged $2,000. They said, it doesn't make sense. So we either go the route of Australia and New Zealand and you spend two full weeks when you come into the country in a government mandated hotel, or we just change it so that everyone has to quarantine at home. But here's what they said, Hal. They said a couple of things. That border officials should be ensuring that there is a suitable quarantine plan. Now, suitable means that you're able to distance from other people in your home. If you have a small apartment with five people, you can't socially distance. If you've got a big home with 15 people, you can't socially distance. It's not going to work. These are things that are happening, and that's how we get these new variants come in and then they're spread. The other thing they found, that second test done on day eight or day 10, depending, only a third of air travelers at the beginning, or sorry, uh, two thirds were doing it, one third were not submitting their second test. We know that about 27 to 30 percent of COVID positive passengers don't test positive until that second test. That's why it's important to have quarantine and have proper testing. The premiers have been screaming about this. The federal government won't do anything. Now their own expert panel says you've got to fix it, and they're not doing it. Brian, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is calling for an investigation into the ties between the Chinese government, Chinese military, and our National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg. What do you think is driving this? Well, what's driving it is that the government's being very tight-lipped. If you remember, it was uh, about two years ago that uh, uh, scientists from the National Microbiology Lab were marched out, along with several students who were des described in media reports at the time as Chinese students that they were taken out and these two scientists, one a doctor, one a, a micro, a, a biologist saying, you know what, you, you've got to get out of here. They were fired earlier this year after evidence presented by CSIS said that these people are a security threat. So here's a couple things that we do know. We know that they worked with several researchers from China. That's not a problem, Hal, and that should not set off alarms for anyone, especially if you're studying the type of respiratory viruses like SARS-CoV-2 that results in COVID-19. Because we know that there's a good chance that these viruses, based on history of the last several decades, will emanate out of China, just like SARS did, just like MERS did, just like COVID-19 did. So everyone's trying to work with China, but we had people with ties to the People's Liberation Army Academy of Medical uh, Sciences working in a lab that you need secret clearance for secret clearance that we don't give to many of our own researchers, that many in our military would not have access to this type of lab. And we gave that access to a researcher from the People's Liberation Army of China medical team. That, you know, we should know more about that. We should know more about the people that were fired and why they were fired and the government won't say anything. So far, all they've been doing is turning around and saying, well, you're racist if you ask about this. And Brian, the Prime Minister was at the receiving end of a lecture from Conservative MPs of Asian descent who took issue with his claim that the Tories were guilty of anti-Asian racism. What happened there? Oh, so th this was uh, incredible to watch. So it was uh, uh, last week on Wednesday that uh, the Prime Minister was up in the House of Commons and asking questions or uh, answering questions. Right. And Aaron O'Toole had asked about it. And, you know, and then conservative backbenchers started asking and eventually Trudeau got irritated. And it started off in French first with uh, conservative MP Pierre Paul Huss, then uh, Michael Barrett and then Candace Bergen. And he accused each of them of stoking anti-Asian racism. Well, the next day, Michael Chong, uh, uh, Kenny Shu and Nellie Shin all got together and said, you know what, this is garbage. Um, uh, Kenny Chu actually uh, described the PM in his statement in the House of Commons. He said he didn't want to take lessons from brownface, blackface. Um, and he slammed the prime minister. They issued a statement. They each made statements or asked questions in the House. 
And Nelly Shin, um, who was, you know, Michael Chan's born here of both Chinese and Dutch parents, uh, both immigrants to Canada. Uh, Kenny Chu immigrated as a teenager. Nelly Shin, she came as a child from Korea. And they're all saying, look, you've never experienced anti-Asian racism. We have, and you're making it, you're cheapening what's really happening by making this claim. Don't do this. And by the way, these are serious questions. They deserve serious answers. I applaud them for doing that because the prime minister throws around the racist card as soon as he's in trouble, even when it's not warranted. Most of the time, it's not warranted. Now, you wrote a couple of months ago about anti-racism training the Trudeau government was putting executives at Global Affairs through. What took place with that training, and do you know the cost involved? Uh, we know the cost involved now, but to remind people what was going on, this was the training that told executives that, um, well, only white people can be racist. Described, uh, it, it used the term, this place we now call Canada, bit strange for the government of Canada, to have training that says this place we now call Canada, um, saying Canada is built on all kinds of myths. It, look, it may be, and we can have a discussion, but it, it was very bizarre training that said markers of white supremacy include objectivism. So being objective means that you are white supremacist. Um, having a sense of urgency is a sign of white supremacy. Come on, hurry up, we gotta go, we're gonna miss the train. That's apparently white supremacy. Uh, all of these things, uh, perfectionism, individualism, uh, it, it declared that Thanksgiving was racist. It declared, rightly so, that wearing blackface is racist, but I'm not sure they told the prime minister that. But, oh, by the way, we found out it cost $148,000, Al, to put just shy of 400 people through. The cost isn't that big, but given what's in the material, I'd say we were definitely ripped off. Brian, the Aaron O'Toole Conservatives have joined with politicians from the UK, Australia, and New Zealand to put forth a trading block of English-speaking Democratic allies, but so far, Canada can't even get a deal with the UK and has something to do with British cheese? <laughs> so uh, I think this Kanzuk idea is a great one. And Aaron O'Toole's been championing it for many years. So is his foreign affairs critic that we just spoke of, Michael Chong. Uh, these guys say, look, let's, let's put together a trading block. Why aren't we trading with the United Kingdom, with New Zealand, with Australia, thus Kanzuk? And some people even add the United States in there. Uh, the Americans so far have not signed on to this letter. But you know, over the weekend, Boris Johnson's doing an interview and he's asked about a trade deal with Canada. We only have a tentative trade deal with the UK since they've left Europe and we can't get a permanent one, Boris Johnson says, because Justin Trudeau's afraid of British cheese. Uh, he doesn't want to upset the Quebec dairy farmers, which is the core of the, the dairy industry. I know that we have um, supply management farmers in every province of the country. I'm going to hear from them now that I've said that. But he is really worried about the Quebec dairy farmers. Boris Johnson in the UK, they have their own dairy industry. They want to sell us lots of cheddar. You know, and our guys are saying we don't want the competition. The Trudeau liberals also are not overly keen on doing trade deals with places like Britain. So I doubt that this is going to go forward until we change government. But I think it's a great idea. We used to do an awful lot of trade with Britain until the Suez crisis, until Lester Pearson. And uh, since then, things have been going downhill. We should uh, start working with countries that have similar trading systems and environmental conditions and all the other things. Why trade uh, have free trade deals with places that have much lower standards than we do instead of trading with places that have similar standards? Toronto Sun columnist and one of our regular contributors, Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal. Well, we all know that people have different personalities, but do we know to what extent this can impact marital relationships? And perhaps more controversially, there are gender differences which can also impact marriage. Joining us to discuss this is Brent Taylor. He is a Lethbridge marriage coach and the author of His, Hers, Greatest Need, of course, his and hers with a Z or a Z, which is an interesting way to spell that. Brent, Brent, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you. It's uh, again, it's an honor and it's a privilege to be here. And thank you. Of course. So, first of all, can you briefly share a little bit about what you do to help couples improve their relationships? Right. Um, well, the book started out with discovering. And what I share is his and hers greatest need. 
um, which you can find in here. And then the single biggest reason why marriages break down, how to build them up. And again, the greatest way a husband loves his wife and the greatest way a wife loves her husband. Those are four key components that I share with them when I first meet with them or I do an introduction session. And that is the big aha. After that, I get into the program that I coach them with, UCG, Understanding Communication and Giving. And in that, in the understanding component, there's personalities, love languages, gender, plus values and beliefs. And then in the communication, we do a safe talk, which involves appreciation, sensitive items, and apology talk. I've incorporated the five apology languages from Dr. Gary Chapman into the scripting of the safe talk. But the most important part that I work with them on is the giving, U, C, and G, understanding, communication, and giving. Really, I got to get to the heart. Everybody thinks it's a mindset. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's true, but it's really a heart set and boils down to our motive. So that's the biggest area that I get to because most people don't realize how selfish we are. Oh, gosh. Yeah, true. <laughs> you need someone to almost hold up that mirror in front of you, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, of, yeah. of course, your book talks so much about the differences between men and women. So I guess before we get to talking about personality and gender differences, you write in your book that the greatest need for a husband is significance. Can you explain what you mean by husbands needing a significance? Right. Well, kind of the best way I put it is every guy um, wants to be his wife's hero. Whether he's dating to be married or whether he is married and whether he's 22 or whether he's 62. He, sometimes it can subside and things like that, but every guy wants to be his wife's hero. And every woman, she wants to be fought for. So it kind of makes sense that he wants to be her hero and she wants to be fought for. And it's kind of romantic, but I always say when, you know, God created man, he said it was good. And we created a woman, he said, whoo, man. And um, it's just, it's just, it really is. It's a love story. And yeah, it's not all full of roses and, and the roses grow better through the manure together. But the reality is deep down inside, he wants to be your hero. He wants to be important to her. And men can have ego issues. Tell me one man that doesn't struggle with ego issues. That's rooted in his desire to be significant, but sometimes it can tip the teeter-totter and he, you know, confidence is one thing, but also humility and humbleness is another thing. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from, do you think, that need to, of significance? I think we all have it, but you speak specifically to, to men. Right. Now, women want to be significant as well. It's... It's just not their deep core need. Hers is security, emotional and physical security. And, you know, the man's is significance. It actually goes back to the book of Genesis. Um, it goes back to the fall in the garden. And we kind of amped up our needs. We increased them because we wanted to be independent. We fell away. So there was actually a curse that said, you know, Cursed are you, you will toil the land all the days of your life. You can't work hard enough. Basically, he was saying, you want to be independent? I'm going to amp it up a little bit. Same thing with women. You want to be independent? I'm going to amp up your need for security. So it really comes down to, to that. Um, but if you think about it, if a man's designed to be a provider and a protector, um, her need for security then falls in line with that protection. He wants to protect her. He was made to give his life for his wife. I use the Titanic. Um, even in the feminist world, I say, well, let's, let's pretend we got the Titanic and the ship's going down and down and down and down. And you have co-captains instead of one captain. So you got a man and woman. And uh, everybody's jumping on lifeboats. And, and there's only one lifeboat left and room for one more person. Man's looking at woman. And who do you think is going to say you take the last spot on the last lifeboat? better be the man mm -hmm. and who do you think is going to accept the offer <laughs> the, the one and who do you think is going to have some tears going down her face for yeah. how much he loved her because he gave his life for his wife and so 
yeah, that you, so that's really the tell to the litmus test that he wants to be her protector, her, her provider. He wants to fight for her and she wants to be fought for. So it makes you know sense that he would want to be her hero, which ties into being significant. Yes, she wants to be significant too, but it's not as deep a core need. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, of course, there are those who would argue that men and women are the same, that there's no real difference. But you, of course, would say that there really are differences in the way our brains are hardwired. Can you explain some of these gender differences? Well, generally speaking, um, and it happens biologically at, at birth or at a very, very young age, um, boys and girls are wired basically the same. But at a very young age, we're talking weeks old or even, I don't know if it might be in the womb, but I think it's after testosterone hits the brain of a little boy. Massive amounts of testosterone hit a little boy. But in the early stages, they're generally the same. The, the communication, the verbal interaction, when you're changing their diapers and you're smiling and goo goo gaga over your children and there's a connection. But because of the testosterone that hits the male brain, it decreases his connection of that verbal relational emotional connection and it increases his tendency for action and aggression if he's going to be a provider if he's going to sacrifice his life then he has to be willing to put himself at the front end of the battle lines to protect his wife and children that testosterone is necessary and here's proof lots of ladies think well my husband just wants me for sex or they feel used. Well, actually, man was purpose designed to love his wife. A lot of people think God gave man, woman to be his helpmate. Yes, there's merit there, but largely God is a giver of love. And man was made to give his wife love. And he just happens because of the testosterone, he happens to love physically. Women tend to connect emotionally first before the physical kicks in. They want, to, they want to trust. They want to feel secure. They want to know things are looked after. They want to know that she can give herself to him. But men come alive physically first, then the emotional, and then women are kind of the opposite. So I would say God's got a sense of humor because they're kind of missing each other here. So th there's a hardwired difference between male and female. Another one is... I believe it's the right side of the brain. The boy's brain, little boy's brain is more wired for spatial, how objects move in space. How many women, you're trying to find a house, you're going to go visit some friends and you, you think, well, my husband should just ask for directions. And he goes, no. They think, well, he's got ego issues. Ah, maybe a little bit, but also men actually enjoy figuring out how to get from here to here, how things move in space. They want to figure that out. So there's another difference. Ladies, they just want to get from point A to point B. And so there's a spatial arrangement. Ladies tend to be more relational and guys tend to be more spatial. Mm -hmm. And want to fix the problems too. So we all know that men like to fix problems and women just want their husbands to listen to their problems. Right, because I say, guys, listen with your eyes and zip your lip. And because most men think, why are we talking unless we're solving a problem? And women think, why are we solving a problem? I just want you to listen. Because men love solving. So when he's solving, when a husband is solving his wife's problem, he's actually loving her. But she doesn't see it as that. She takes it critically because here's what most women don't realize. And I just said it to a couple the other day. And immediately she acknowledged and smiled. And I said, she wants to know that he cares about how she feels about the problem. So you don't need to fix the problem. You need to care how she feels about the problem because she's looking for the heart connection. She's looking again for that security. She wants to know that you care about how she feels. So there's a definite difference. Whereas guys say, why don't we just solve the problem? Then you won't have those feelings anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny how so many times couples have such different personalities. So like opposites, they say opposites seem to attract, right? But apparently the personality differences can cause some serious clashes. So is it important or worthwhile to take time to do a personality analysis in order to understand how we see the world as compared to our spouse? 
The, the short answer is yes. <laughs> it's definitely worthwhile. Um, when I had my company called BCT Structures, I had to lose my $50 million company. Largest plant built in manufacturing. I know I'm bragging to you, there's the guy's ego. Um, and I had to lose it all. But even when I had it and I was going through all my struggles in life, and I'm a bit of a softy, I wanted this for our employees, not too much of this and none of this. How do we get here? So all of the staff that I hired, I used the personality. And I used true colors. I didn't know true colors back then, but I was using this eight questions. It's now 10 questions that I've expanded it to. It's all over North America. They use it in the school systems. And it's the simplest to use because in the color code of blue, green, orange, and gold, you can tell who's the more sensitive or romantic one, which is important when you're coaching couples. They also have cards for children. They can quickly arrange it in 10 seconds. They know who they are. Personalities is important because blue is sensitive, relational, green is analytical, orange is spontaneity, fun, go for it, and gold is organized and structured. They have their upside and their downside. It's very, very important. Goals are organized and structured and loyal, but they're bossy, controlling, and inflexible. Blues are sensitive, compassionate, and caring. They're bleeding heart and needy and an enabler. So we need to know our greatest strengths to be our greatest weaknesses. So what I do for couples, and I combine their personalities with their love languages. So they get their score in their love languages. So words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. So when you combine those two with the gender, you have a very powerful profile. And I share with the husband and wife how they individually tick, but also where they connect and where they disconnect. When you can understand each other, you can go, oh, that's why they behave and think the way they do. They have a different set of lenses we also get into upbringing. So our upbringing is a huge manifestation. So it is very wise to understand. Most people think they're going to get it through osmosis. Mm -hmm. No, you need to learn. Right. So when spouses do have those conflicting personality types, what advice do you have to adjust for this to make things work? Is there anything people need to adjust in their, I don't know, I don't want to say personality, but I guess, right. yeah. Um, good question. The adjustment um, first comes from understanding. I think there's a huge wall that starts to come down when we understand the way each other thinks and, and feels and perspectives. So at least you can start to understand it. You don't just criticize or get mad at them for not seeing it my way. That's important. The other thing we do get to, which is huge, is because, as I shared with you before, when we cross our arms that becomes the comfortable way. But if I was to reverse it, most people struggle to reverse it. That can be comfortable. So it's what we get used to. There's only two motives in the world. It's either love or selfishness. It's either what you can do for me or what can I do for you? Most of the time, Christian or non-Christian, we're focused on me, 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 me. We don't know it. That's our number one problem in the world. We're addicted to self and we're comfortable with it. So we're habitually practiced at it. So I can get to the head and the heart, but if we don't get to the habit, so not only understanding, which helps, then helping them have a communication tool, which I call safe talk, but ultimately we need to start practicing giving. And here's the cool part. When we're giving, we're living. Why does it take a high river flood, a Fort McMurray fire, California fire, a Haiti, Japan, a New Orleans? Why does it take a disaster for us to get off our selfish couches and go give expecting nothing in return? Expecting nothing in return. So if I can help husband and wife understand each other and they can start giving expecting nothing in return. And I say, husbands, when you treat your wife right, she blossoms. Can you imagine if husbands and wives started putting the other one first? Because the true definition of love is, love is self-giving, not self-seeking. Love is me last and you first. Yeah, what a wonderful world it would be. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that, 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 that's why that's why Jesus came to give His life. He wanted to show us that not only save us, but show us that love is me last, not me. And when you start to put the other first, when you're giving, you come alive, and the gift is in the giving. So once we realize, I've been going in the wrong. I was going in the wrong direction. Right. And the more I chase the me, me, me race, the more empty. Brent, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your wisdom. We appreciate having you on again. Thank you. And I just want to have that little quote I shared before. I said, you know, if we can put love back in the marriage, we can put love back in the world. There you go. Right there. Brent Taylor is a Lethbridge marriage coach and the author of His, Hers, Greatest Need. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.